I'm only 14 years old. You'd never be able to tell. Don't get me into a lawsuit, Lisa. You know, one of my predictions for 2022 is that by the end of this year, OpenSea will be out of business and everybody like freaked out. You know, if you, if you actually want things decentralized, you probably don't want to start with iOS is kind of my point. Amen. Hi guys, it's Lisa and I'm really excited for this panel today on NFTs. So all things NFTs. So I've got some incredible guests joining from actually all around the world. So this is a bit of a global webinar, which is really exciting. Um, I definitely can say that I have the least sexiest accent on this call, unfortunately. I sound like a bogan. Anyway, uh, without further ado, I want to kick it off by introducing our stellar lineup. So first off, we have the amazing John Chris. Kraski, I always want to say Krasinski, um, but Kraski, he's the better, John. Um, he is the Director, and Strategic, uh, Director of Strategic Partnerships at uh, NFT Entertain Entertainment Studio, backed by Mark Cuban. Uh, he's also the co-founder of the NFT Thought Leaders, and he's the host of one of my favorite NFT podcasts, NFT Heat. So welcome to the panel, John. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's... that's uh, Nice to be uh, referred to as John Krasinski, although people actually think I look more of uh, the people on the office. People think I look more like Ed Helm and not John Krasinski. But, uh, oh, my yeah. God. You actually do. The Nard Dog. <laughs> yes. There you go. Yeah. The, the good thing is, though, if you were John Chris, um, Krasinski, you're the glow yeah. up version of John Krasinski, not the office version, because he was like. Yeah, a yeah. Bit of but yeah, if you go, but if you Google my name too, all that all that pops up is pictures of John Krasinski. So yeah, yeah, I definitely just run with it. Um, and actually, on the panel, we also have your co-founder of NFT Thought Leader. So in a funny story, I actually so I reached out to you, John, on LinkedIn to ask you to be on this panel. And then I reached out to Charles, not knowing that you guys were such good friends. So, so we've got Charles Adkins, who is the uh, global president of marketing at Admix, and you're the ex-VP of Polygon, um, and you're all the way in California. And actually, one interesting thing we were talking about before the show is that your um, one of your first clients was Yahoo. So you've been in the internet game for a long time. So you're an OG. So welcome to the panel, Charles. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I started back when everything was in black and white and there was no webinar. So it's, hopefully I <laughs> hopefully I look younger than I actually am. That's this is a good thing to good thing to be. Yeah, look, I definitely feel like Web3 is aging me rapidly. Like a day in Web3 world is like 10 years in in the real world. I mean, I'm uh, I'm, so I'm only I'm only 14 years old. You'd never be able to tell. <laughs> uh, you look great. Whatever your skincare is, uh, your skincare routine is, I definitely need some tips on this um, webinar. Um, so thank you for joining us, Charles. And last but not least, we have the co-host of my co-host of the Super Earth Podcast, um, joining us all the way from Brazil. Uh, we have Diego, who is the also the co-founder of Chile Performance Marketing Agency and Verge, which is a uh, verse. <laughs> which is a Web3 agency. Uh, Verge is Diego. sacred, so uh, don't get me into a lawsuit, Lisa. <laughs> uh, yeah. Welcome to the show. I wanted Thank some, um, an I wanted an interesting fact about you, but um, I wanted a PG and there were none. I'm boring, apparently. I'm boring, I'm boring. <laughs> or, or incredibly just uh, not PG. So uh, yeah, you choose, you we'll choose which side of me you want to go with. We'll definitely go with incredibly not PG. Uh, <laughs> but in today's webinar, we I'm actually just going to dive straight into it because we had so many questions come in from the audience. So uh, just to kick things off, John, I'm going to throw to you uh, as the co-host of NFT Heat. What is an NFT? Because there'll be some people on here who are like, what is an NFT? So can you kick things off by giving us like a simple, easy to understand version? You know, I always steal Charles's answer because he came on our podcast and I think Charles, has, I actually think Charles has the best explanation of what it is. So I don't even want to steal his explanation because I, I do, I leverage it. But Charles, why don't you actually, when you are on our podcast, tell people what you think. I, it's actually the simplest way to explain it. And I think it'll probably shed light on kind of the whole NFT thing for everybody. Yeah, I don't even know which explanation I used on oh, your podcast. Oh, yeah, 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 you used that. Uh, that you use the mini computer. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh. So there, there's a, there, there's a couple ways that I like to explain it to people. Number one, I always try to l tell people right off the bat that an NFT is not art. 
an NFT is actually a token that can have any kind of payload attached to it. So think of it as a truck and inside that truck, the truck is the NFT, that's the token. And whatever you attach to that could be art, it could be a ticket to a show, it could be access for you to get into a building, it can be your identification. That's the actual payload attached to the token. And when it comes to smart contracts, what I said on, on John's uh, podcast is that just think of NFTs and smart contracts as mini supercomputers and whatever you want to program them to do, they, they will do. So, you know, if somebody doesn't pay you on time, if they're, let's say you set up a smart contract and you say, you know, you paid two days late, well, you can have the smart contracts say that your bank pays them 2% less. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's one of those things that you just program in at the beginning and they last long-term. Yeah, fantastic. And actually, uh, your episode of NFT Heat was the first NFT podcast I ever listened to. So it's kind of weird. So now I'm like talking to you both. So uh, that's excellent. And, and really great point because a lot of people think that NFTs are just pixel art and it's, you know, they think it's a scam because people, uh, you know, are getting rug pulled or they're getting, you know, I think scammed out of their money because they're buying into projects and they're going nowhere. John, what do you think is the biggest thing people should look for when they're looking to get into NFT projects? What's the biggest thing? I mean, just the, the projects now, I think it's the team, you know? I think it's the team. I mean, Charles did a post about utility and roadmap. I mean, those are just such nonsense, right, Charles? I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, because I mean, these, these teams, you don't even know who these people are. A lot of them are probably like former DJs and skateboarders and they're just like, all of a sudden creating this like robust roadmap and promising people all this stuff. But the reality is like 95% of them are not going to be able to deliver on any of this. It's all nonsense. So I, I think they're probably doing a disservice to the NFT industry and really probably inhibiting mass consumer adoption. Uh, you know, that, that's my biggest concern is that just right now, it's still a little wild, wild west. It's uh, a little rogue. So as, as smarter money and smarter minds get in this space, I think you'll, you'll see a lot of these things tighten up. And I, I think a lot of these, these PFP projects you see now are probably going to start to get washed out over the next year because a lot of them are going to be forced to deliver on what they promised and they're not. And then people are really going to realize that, you know, this is, this is, this is uh, an industry that needs to kind of tighten up in terms of just like, you know, the bad actors that are in the space right now. I'm not saying they're all bad actors, but there, there's probably a lot of bad actors. And I mean, I mean, I, I'm Charles can interject. He's, He's more deeply entrenched uh, in the, you know, on the collecting side of the space than I am, but uh, that's sort of my two cents. Yeah, I think, look, uh, I think the success of Bored Apes and CryptoPunks, which are probably two of the most successful NFT um, collections of all time, has really almost done the industry a disservice because everyone's just trying to replicate what they're doing in the hopes of replicating their success and I might throw to you Diego because why do you think those projects have been so successful versus other people who are arguably creating you know 10,000 um, similar images but not as successful as those as those projects yeah um, <clears throat> I think that that's um, um, <laughs> I think that's the the billion dollar question right like what makes a project successful um, probably Charles and John will be able to uh, to to uh, to give the better, you know, like uh, uh, what is what is it that someone look, needs to look for uh, to to be able to set them apart. Um, but you know, what one thing that I remember, I mean, I remember being a kid at school in university and hearing about Bitcoin for the first time, um, and then of course seeing all all coins come after it, and then finally we got the infamous uh, shit coins, right? Um, and if you're investing into a shit coin, you know pretty much what you're getting into, right? It's 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 nothing but a gamble. Um, and a lot of these projects, I mean, you know, we hear, we listen, we <coughs> all the time we hear about utility, utility, utility about it within the NFT space. Uh, but um, I think that what sets great projects apart from others, and and this is my opinion, Charles and John, please. In, in like any second come in and say like no this kid doesn't know what he's talking about but um i i think that number one um there there is an element of almost like a first player strategy uh advantage uh, first player advantage uh sort of like thing where of course you're a trailblazer um you do it right and you've you know you've you've you know what you're doing 
um, <coughs> you have a lot of the of that initial traction. Um, a second thing would be, of course, the people that are behind it. Um, you know, the the people behind Board Apes and um, CryptoPunks um, are um, powerhouses within within the niche. So, of course, um, uh, it's kind of like a famous or a, a, a known entrepreneur launching a new project. Uh, you know more or less what to expect. Last but not least, um, the community, right? Uh, I think that this is the point that John always talks about. Uh, but the engagement around these projects is is just out of this world. Um, and I think that a lot of people today, you know, I saw um, uh, yesterday someone saying that my, uh, my brother launched a, an NFT project. Uh, he, drew, he drew some pictures and launched it and made 300 bucks. Um, and, and now he thinks he's the boss of me. Uh, so, so basically, uh, I, I, I think that it's an oversimplification of, of a whole process of, you know, it, it doesn't need to be as complicated as it sounds as well. Uh, so, you know, like, uh, th there is an amount of community. John always, you know, he said it on our podcast. It's all about secondary sales as well, getting that thing, you know, like going and, and, and getting a community engaged. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, uh, all in all. I think uh, it's uh, we're getting to a point where we're we're able to separate um, real projects that are backed by a real community, by real you know founders and uh, a real you know like experience or not not experience because you know it's it's fairly new, but uh, uh, solid uh, uh, people involved in the project and projects that are just you know you know let's see whatever can stick. Yeah, fantastic. I, I definitely think, you know, when it comes to creating and launching NFT projects, people think it is as easy as just, I'm just going to put out a whole lot of pictures and then list it on OpenSea. And exactly. Then make, and become, let's just million. wait for the money to come in, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely not as easy as that. I wish it was because then I think we'd all be rich. Um, no, and, but, that's, like, but that's a good thing. I, I'd say, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but I think that's, uh, you know, I always like to link it back to brands and how this can translate into uh, B2B actual, like, you know, action, um, uh, um, actual insights and, and, and actions. Uh, but uh, this is a major space where, like, if you get into the space with a, a, an insane amount of advantage already, which is a well-known brand, for instance, say, for instance, Adidas, right? Adidas is launching their NFT project. They have already. Um, it's completely different, right? It's, it's something that they already have a community around the brand. They already have a value proposition. They already have blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's you know, almost like a, a, like a sure way to go, in my opinion, for a brand like that, right? Yeah, it's actually interesting talking about big brands jumping into the space because I feel like, uh, you know, Adidas have jumped in, Nike's jumped in, a whole lot of big brands, and I, I definitely think we're going to see more. John, I might throw this question to you. What, um, I guess, what big brands have you seen enter the space and do it in a really good way, and why? You know, I mean, the Dolce Gabbana drop was super interesting, and Charles can speak to that a little bit because that was actually a drop that was done with Polygon, right, Charles? Oh, yeah. Did Charles? So, I mean, hopefully, Charles got the crown NFT. I wanted the crown. <laughs> I, well, I wanted the I wanted the Doge crown. It went for like eight hundred grand, though. Yeah, we did we did the we did the D and G. We did Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. We did uh, like a just a handful of you know crazy drops. And some people do them great. Some people do them terribly. It just you you have to have a reason to be there. I think. Um, so I'm, I won't interrupt John's answer, but I, I can speak to it later if, if you'd want me to. No, you keep going, Charles. I mean, I mean, you can just interplay me. Me and Charles talk all the time, so I mean, we can just like that's why I just shifted it yeah. back to you. So yeah. No, I mean, the, the, you know, you just you really just have to have a reason to be in the in the space. I think like really think about what your customers are going to want and are they there? Um, you know, Adidas, Nike, they do really good things, but you. You have to think kind of to Diego's point, like those are those are brands like I like to use the analogy that Simon Sinek uses all the time. He says, you know, um, if Nike made a hotel, you would know exactly what that hotel is like. But if Marriott made a shoe, you, you have no idea because Nike has a brand and Marriott has a logo. There is a big difference. That is amazing. That is amazing. And it's just, it's one of those things where you imagine a major brand that actually has a brand, you could, you could tell them to make any product and you know exactly what that product would be like.
because they've built an ethos and a community around what their values are. It's just, it's a lot different than having a logo. I think Branza did a good, Dolce & Gabbana, they did a great job, I think. Um, drop it on Polygon, they had concerns around environmental impact, so that's a low environmental impact chain. Um, the other thing is they attached access utility to it. So for people that bought that NFT, um, you got to have a two week trip to Italy, you get to tour you know, the, the main design house, you get to collaborate on designs with the, the head designers. Um, so there was a lot of things that came along with that as well. If you bought some of them, you got the digital piece and the couture physical piece, um, which came along with it, and then full provenance, which means you could track the authenticity forever for life. Um, so they did some really cool things. You know, bad brands in the place, I can't even name any to point out because they're just so, you just don't hear about them. I mean, they try it for five minutes and it's over. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's been some pretty bad ones, but I just really don't pay attention to them. Yeah. I mean, in my world, I mean, a lot of the big brands are really haven't jumped in yet. They're, I've been dealing with one global auto manufacturer and literally started the conversation April of last year. And it's just now getting to a point where they're actually interested in potentially doing their first NFT you know, collection. And that probably based on how things are trending, it'll probably not be until April of this year at the, the earliest. So that's a whole year. And a lot of it's educating the brands. I mean, that's the other part, the education part. That That's that's what Charles and I probably spent most of 2020 doing is just educating big brands on what is an NFT. I don't know what, you know, how do you launch an, a successful NFT project and walking them through all the different, you know, things that are necessary. So, you know, the creative part, the tech and dev, the how to build community on Discord and the marketing. It's, it's just a, it's, it's a lot of work. And, and then there's a lot of these big companies have layers and layers and layers of management that need to approve everything. And they all have different concerns. Some it's like just, you know, the, the environmental impact. The others, it's the IP, you know, what, what happens when you actually create an NFT and, uh, you know, somebody buys that, what happens with their IP? There's, you know, lot, lots of the concerns that they have as brands. And they obviously have built up, you know, decades and decades, maybe even centuries of brand equity to consumers, and they don't want to all of a sudden just wash it or road by launching an NFT collection. So there's really, you know, they have to be very careful about that because, you know, your brand is everything. So, uh, so that's, you know, it's a very important concern. These NFTs are fun and sexy, but I mean, the reality is still, like I said before, it's the wild, wild west. And it's like the, the majority of the transaction volume right now is being kind of driven by more rogue individuals, I hate to say it. I mean, not, not to say everybody that is, but that, that's just the majority of the transaction volume right now. So I think, uh, but people like Flow, you know, we work with Flow a lot. I feel like they're doing a really good job uh, creating a, an ecosystem and a marketplace for big brands to feel safe and, you know, it's kind of getting that, you know, that everyday consumer in, into the space. So I think you just kind of have to look at kind of what, uh, what different blockchains are doing and, you know, Obviously, I'm biased because you know, NFT Genius is very strategically aligned with with Flow and Dapper. But uh, yeah, you know, it's you got you got you know, there's a, there's a lot of different people kind of in the space right now. But uh, yeah, I think the big brands are going to start to gravitate towards certain blockchains more than others. So, um, you know, I've 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 done B2B for for a while now, um, and and John hit the nail on the head um, with the education part. Uh, the problem is that the the speed that user adoption happens is far superior to what companies are implementing today, right? Like companies take too just far too long to to speak their consumers' language. An example of that, let's let's say something obvious, right? Again, brands have the first player advantage here. Brands can come in and a brand that has a following. Uh, that has, you know, like, 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 like Charles said, uh, a brand that has actual brand equity can make this into their, you know, just su like such an amazing advantage. Um, uh, take Rolex, for instance, right? You have, you have now a guy that is selling virtual watches for more than actual Rolexes go for. And Rolex could have been the one to take the first step and done that. And and knowing the Rolex audience, they would have bought into it, right? You would have you would have had the first Rolex NFTs in history. You would have you would have been part of that 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 community, that initial community, that founders community, right? 
and which is what Rolex is all about, right? The ex exclusivity and blah 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 and, and such and such. And it's it's not just Rolex, you know. You can take so many brands from this, but we don't see that movement from brands. Um, yeah, and it's, again, it's such a lost opportunity, right? Yeah, look, I definitely agree. I was talking to someone from a bank um, this week and I was saying, asking if they're looking at Web3. He goes, like, they're barely out of, like, Web1. So, <laughs> it's like, I think this is actually going to be a problem for a lot of the bigger brands. They're going to be way too slow to move. Uh, there will be people from brands and, you know, marketing departments in brands on this call. So, do you guys think, and, uh, John, I'll, I might ask this question to you, like, do you feel like they have to have some sort of Web3 strategy before they even enter the space or would you just encourage them to just do something and then just pivot from there and see how that goes? I think they have to have some strategy, obviously. I mean, it's, it's obviously it should be focused on communities like uh, Diego mentioned before and I had mentioned when we spoke earlier. So how can you really engage your, 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 you know, your, your customers in a, a deep and meaningful manner. I think that's super important. So I would, I would start with that as opposed to just like, oh, you know, we, we have some cool art or memorabilia that would be great for NFTs. I think you have to dig a little deeper. So I, I would just really focus on that community building part. And, but yeah, I, I would start small. I, would, I wouldn't like go super big and just uh, all of a sudden do like a 50,000 or 100,000 you know, unit NFT drop. I would try to do something small, both spoke, like like the D and G drop. I think that was what nine NFTs total, Charles. Is that right? Super yeah. small, curated. I think I think smaller is better. Just kind of get your feet wet. See, kind of kind of almost A B test. I think I think there's going to be a lot of A B testing for brands right now. So I think that's you're going to have to deal with that kind of cadence. Uh, you know, you're not going to always just knock it out of the park on the first try. I think I think small and. And, and try that and then from there build out. And that's, that's what most of the brands that I'm talking to want to do, something a little smaller and curated, kind of see how that goes and then they'll kind of, uh, you know, well, kind of uh, branch out from there. So. And brands also uh, need to also not be afraid if things go wrong because things probably will go wrong. So I recently signed up for the Prada Adidas NFT um, drop and there was, I think, like a day or two delay in revealing uh, the the actual artwork that got selected. I think the actual concept was amazing, but the technology is also new that things are going to go wrong. And I feel like the community really understands that. And as long as you're communicating, you are, um, you know, I think people will understand that everything, everyone's trying to work out their way in the space. Um, Charles, I want to ask you this question because I get asked this question a lot about NFTs and everyone always says, are they, you know, they've heard that it's really bad for the environment. So please um, debunk that myth. <laughs> um, if you're, if you're doing Ethereum transactions constantly, I will tell you one Ethereum transaction has the same impact on the environment as burning 15 liters of gasoline right in your front yard. So, you know, that's probably not great um, solution to that. Obviously, there's a lot of layer two solutions. I was, you know, at Polygon for a long time and it's just a different, you know, method in which you kind of prove out the block. So proof of work versus proof of stake. Um, I won't go like super deep deep into that, but it's just a, a different consensus mechanism that allows people like Polygon, Avalanche, any EVM compatible blockchain to basically group up Ethereum blockchains into large groups and send them to the main chain at once. So you're just doing one giant transaction that actually holds 50,000 mini transactions in each one as they go back and forth to Ethereum. Um, so that's one way that, that you can, you know, beat that. I know Ethereum is changing to proof of stake. Supposedly now I've heard it's going to be Q3, Q4. They've stopped calling it ETH 2.0. Now they're calling it the consensus. Um, I have my doubts it'll ever happen, to be quite honest with you, because the method in which they're doing it's extremely complicated. And if they are able to do it, I mean, congrats to that team. I think it's just going to be very tough to pull off. So... Um, bad for the environment. There's ways that you can offset things too. Um, we've worked with clients in the past. They they do carbon offsets right in their their smart contracts, where you know they donate a certain amount of the proceeds, or they refund all of the gas fees that go directly to you know rainforest foundations and other you know environmental impact groups that 
are set aside for carbon credits and carbon offsets and all of that stuff. You can build that right into the smart contract. So it's really transparent. I know a lot of companies like doing that because, you know, if they're ever environmentally audited, they can show a smart contract and say, you know, they, they never even have to take possession of the funds. It just goes directly to the foundation. So that's another cool thing about smart contracts is it's very transparent about where every single dime goes and you really can't hide within those. Yeah, fantastic. Um, good. I'm just going to reel out that exact answer next time someone answers, uh, ask me that question. So I might just record that and have that on my phone really handy. So thanks. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> what, what he said, and I'll just play that. Um, okay, that's great. Because I think a lot of people, and that's actually one of the quiet, the one of the common questions that we had. People were really obviously concerned about the environment and the impact it has on there. So uh, thanks for answering that, Charles. Uh, Diego. I think, the, th uh, I, I think the, th the thing I'll say on that, like just like closing out on on my portion of that, is I will say with any nascent technology, it is getting better. I mean, let's let's not forget when we first started the industrial revolution, we were like openly burning coal in open pits and like luckily we've gone a century and now we can have electric vehicles but i mean we're in that like coal burning phase of blockchain where it's like we're on dial-up modems we're burning coal we're just like total nightmares right now for the environment but we're, we're getting better and we're getting better a lot faster than most other technologies so i think like in the next couple of years those concerns are going to go away pretty quick yeah, and that, that you actually raise a really good point because the level of technical, I guess, evolution is so much quicker than it was like five years ago, 10 years ago. Like it, it's actually crazy how fast things are moving. I don't know, John, we've sort of had a chat about this before because you, I think, how long have you been in the space for? Because you were doing, you know, things in a totally different industry and then you you discovered NFTs and they changed your life. But how have you found jumping into the space? I love it. I mean, I think it's, there's, for me, it's an advantage. I think a lot of people, if you're trying to pivot from a, maybe a non-tech related background, it's just so nascent. So I think, you know, just working hard, willing to learn, being passionate, hungry, willing to talk to a lot of people. I think those are like sort of the necessary attributes for success right now in the space. It's changing a little bit. Obviously, there's a lot. I'm starting to see a lot more of the, the Amazon, Microsoft, Google type uh, personalities enter the space. But I had a head start and, and definitely last year it was just people were still had no clue what an NFT was. So that's the, those attributes have carried, uh, you know, carried me well in the space. But those, those are some of the things, you know, I think yeah, you have to kind of understand blockchain and NFTs. But I think from what, you know, a lot of these things are concepts that you're sort of familiar with in Web 2.0, but they're sort of repackaged in just a different manner. So I don't think any of this thing is like earth shattering. I don't think you need to be you know, a rocket science to figure this out. These are like, you know, Charles is making references to the industrial revolution. I mean, these are all, you can kind of mind map the things that have happened in history before to what's happening now. So don't, don't be scared. Anybody can jump in now. Just, you got to put in a little time to, to read and learn and talk to people. A lot of my learnings have just been through conversations with people I've met either at conferences or on LinkedIn or, you know, just, you know, company calls, just you know, conversations with my CEO, conversations with Charles. I've learned a ton from Charles. I'm talking to him all the time. So, I mean, a lot of it's just talking, talking and learning. I know. I told one, one of the things I, I, I told John, I, you know, one of my predictions for 2022 is that by the end of this year, OpenSea will be out of business and everybody like freaked out. And everyone's <laughs> like, everyone's like, why, why do you believe that? And it's exactly kind of what John said, like history repeating itself, because everything they're doing with their product is the exact same thing I saw Netscape do the year they went out of business. And I'm like, I, I've seen this game before. I've seen this movie and I know how this ends. Yeah, that's actually a really um, bold prediction, but I love it. So calling it early in 2022, uh, yeah, hopefully they, they see that post from you, Charles, and they quickly learn. And uh, I definitely feel like there's going to be so many competitors coming out in the space in the marketplace scene. And also not just um, competitors, but very specifically targeted focused marketplaces. So ones that focus on sport, ones that focus on, you know, entertainment and music. And I think that's one of the biggest things about OpenSea. Like I go on there and it's like a shit show. Like I don't even know where to even look. And I, they have, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say that um, um, what I think is interesting about NFTs is that say like Coinbase now, or you know whatever other platform is launching their NFT platform, um, 
interestingly enough, and I don't know, Charles, John, Nisa, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, not every NFT investor was a previous blockchain investor. So there's a lot of like people that are first getting into NFT investments that never touched the blockchain space. So like it's this it's this gray area of like, you know, like is Coinbase really gonna take OpenSea on head on, right? Like, or is is Binance really gonna take uh OpenSea right, um, head on? So it's it's interesting to see um Charles' point of view. Um I don't know. I've I think I have six or I think I think actually it's gonna be Instagram that takes down everybody. Oh and it, <laughs> Zuckerberg, no. The stock is going like woo. And I think you know, I, and I think it's because, and, may, and maybe not Instagram by name, but think of it more in theory of it's going to be a user-generated NFT minting platform. I think it's going to be people are going to have the technology where they have their own ability. You're going to pick up your phone, look through your gallery on your phone. You're going to single button mint an NFT directly from your phone within probably the next six months. I don't know who's I don't know who's going to do it, but I know Instagram has a head start on it. Um, there's other companies out there doing that, but it's not going to be this process of like connect your MetaMask, connect this, connect that, connect five things, you know, do a backflip. Like it's just the UX UI <laughs> improvements are going to have to come very quickly. And what I don't about, think a marketplace, I mean, Coinbase is going to be good, but we've got Coinbase, Kraken, Crypto.com, Rarible, Looks Rare, Binance. I mean, Binance, like they're all out there. And I think what people want is just, you know what, let me just mint this from my phone. I just took this awesome picture. I'm going to mint this from my phone and send it right to my social profile. What about yeah. uh, Charles? What about, what about Twitter? Twitter Twitter has a lot of noise and I think this is one of the things we were talking about before we kind of came on air was you know the idea of sometimes in the NFT space and blockchain space we kind of live in a vacuum and we think you know we were talking about Discord and it was like oh all the NFT people are Discord all the you know everything is on Discord and I was talking to people that are at Discord and they said only 0.7% of their users even know what NFTs are so wow. 99.3% of their users have no idea what NFTs are. But for all of us in the industry, we just automatically assume that's where you go build a community. And maybe it's not, you know, and I think that's kind of the same thing with Twitter when, I mean, I've been deep down the rabbit hole on NFT Twitter. And I mean, you can get, you can get dug in and like, you'll, you'll get to the point where you think NFTs are the only thing that's on Twitter. <laughs> But, you know, I think it's kind of the same thing. I, I, I like the steps that they're taking to, I do find it interesting that you can verify your NFT on Twitter if you have Twitter blue. So kind of, you know, it's, it's a nod to, yes, we want to be decentralized. And then they've chosen to only make it available on iOS, which is the most closed and centralized platform you could possibly put it on. So, I mean, I don't know. It's you like... Putting out, put, put it, putting out the fire with gasoline, uh, just, it doesn't <laughs> typically work. But, you know, if you, if you actually want things decentralized, you probably don't want to start with iOS is kind of my point. Amen. <laughs> no, I'm an Apple fan girl, so I might just jump off the call now. Uh, Steve yeah, Jobs I, is dead. <laughs> <laughs> Look, all I can say is that as someone who does not like Discord, I'm praying that that's not the the official um, NFT social media um, of choice because it is so freaking hard to use and it just keeps getting hacked. Um, well, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for, but I just want to say a massive, massive thank you to all of you for taking the time to join. I learned a lot as per usual. Um, I definitely want to say, especially um, go and follow John and Charles on LinkedIn because their LinkedIn content is easily some of the best out there on Web3. I get so much value from all of their posts. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you can catch Diego and I on the Super podcast if you want to hear <laughs> more from us talking about Web3. Um, but thanks so much uh, for joining everybody. Um, you can also actually tune into Super to see John's podcast, which is live. And Charles, we've got yours coming up soon too. So if you want to hear more from them, you can check them out there. Um, and then also check out John's podcast, NFT Heat. Uh, that's definitely one of my favorites. So thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank us. you. Thank you. Thank you.